a new world they came, with bright hopes and an indomitable spirit. They left the only place they knew as home. They left the security of their culture, the familiarity of their towns and cities, and even the vast and beautiful land that at times was the enemy and at times was a safe haven. No telephone, no internet or jet travel. This was the world and time in which they lived, where a journey across the Atlantic could last three months. Most of these pilgrims would never see their homeland again. It was a bold step, but one intended to create a new and better life. They came from the farms and factories to ply their trade, some with convenient, sustainable wealth. Others came with only the clothes on their back, while still others indebted their very lives for the coveted passage to the land of freedom and opportunity. The one mighty bond that brought them together was their deep faith and trust in God. Their Catholic religion was the common denominator that made them one people. This is their story, sketched through the broad strokes of time of a faith-filled community that became St. Alphonsus. The German Catholics who formed the Congregation of St. Alphonsus in Wheeling in 1856 were recruited from various sections of Germany and spoke their own dialect. They differed in ideals and customs. However, it was the practice of the Catholic religion that proved to be the bond that united them despite the inherent cultural differences. The first Catholic Germans settling in the Wheeling area were the descendants of pioneers who made their homes in America prior to the Revolutionary War. They were fortunate in acquiring the first homesteads when the country was opened for cultivation. Their numbers were comparatively small, and they were an unassuming and quiet people. The immigrants from Germany came mostly from the central and southern regions. This fact occasioned a happy mixture of people in which the national ideals and peculiarities never led to strife, which had become an unfortunate hallmark of other congregations comprised of immigrants from specific ethnic groups. The majority of German Catholic immigrants were mostly hungry for land. This was at a time when the American frontier was vast and still untamed. They passed through Wheeling, going to the state of Ohio, or down the Ohio River into the Mississippi Valley. Jesuit priest Stephen de Busen, a local missionary at the time, wrote this in his diary. Since they knew farming, some of them to perfection, they would obtain homesteads on which they would settle and form new colonies easier than immigrants from other countries. Other Germans who plied a trade and settled in the cities became, for the most part, prosperous, owing to their industry and skill. It is interesting to note that unlike the English settlers a century before them, those brave souls leaving Germany were not doing so to escape any form of religious persecution. In fact, their arrival in the new country was perhaps highlighted with religious irony. The German Catholics discovered the practice of their religion more difficult in America than in Germany. The German immigrants found more holy days of obligation and more days of fast and abstinence. The Fridays of Advent and the Wednesdays and Saturdays of Lent were just that, required conformity. In Germany, meat was allowed once a day on all weekdays except Fridays. The new German immigrants found that they were not allowed to eat meat in Wheeling on Fridays, whereas in the diocese of their homeland, the Pope had dispensed them from abstinence for centuries. Such newly imposed restrictions on the German Catholics made support of the Catholic Church in America even more tenuous. The economics of the frontier diocese was further strained by ingrained cultural perceptions. In Germany, the government oversaw the financial welfare of the church. Now in America, the German immigrant was obliged to contribute to the support of the church, a thing which their Irish counterparts considered as a matter of course. Greater spiritual or financial obligations were not the only stumbling block to the growth of the German Catholic Church in the newly settled Ohio Valley. The Germans were quite used to their bold and zealous worship services called Singmas, or congregational singing. Of course, the service was performed in their native tongue. In Wheeling, these immigrants found only the Latin Mass, which was unknown in their churches in Germany. These industrious German Americans faced many adversities as newcomers to a strange land. Aside from the hardships of the day, they worked diligently to assimilate to the religious differences within their denomination. Perhaps a small triumph, but one nonetheless that played a pivotal role in solidifying a fledgling congregation. Beginning in 17, they would go from Baltimore to York, Pennsylvania, then to Pittsburgh, 
in order to take a boat down the Ohio River. During the next 15 years, many priests made their passage through Wheeling. It is said that while they were not in Wheeling to specifically tend to the faithful, they are credited with celebrating Mass at the request of Catholics living in the area. When the National Road reached Wheeling in 1817, and when the mighty steamboats began to ply the waters of the Ohio River, Wheeling was a place where priests stopped to rest while making the tiresome journey from Baltimore to the western regions served by the National Road. According to diocesan records, the first priest to come to Wheeling specifically to minister to the Catholic population was a friar minor of St. Francis by the name of Father Charles Bonaventure McGuire. He visited Wheeling from Latrobe, Pennsylvania in 1818 and was entertained by Noah Zane, the son of Colonel Ebenezer Zane, the founder of Wheeling. It was on this occasion that Noah Zane donated the land for the first Catholic church, which was built in 1822 on the corner of 11th and Chaplin Streets. Originally called St. Mary's, the name of the church was changed to St. James. Then in 1876, the church was designated as the Cathedral of the Diocese and renamed St. Joseph. Between the years of 1840 to 1849, the Redemptorist Fathers of Pittsburgh did missionary work among the Germans of Wheeling. It was around 1849 that a German priest, whose name is not chronicled, made his residence in Wheeling. Given the large German presence, the Most Reverend Richard Vincent Whelan permitted special mass services in the cathedral for the Germans' particular worship service. Unfortunately, the priest's tenure was short-lived as he left Virginia in 1851. It was in this very same year, and less than one year after Bishop Whelan successfully lobbied for the creation of the Diocese of Wheeling, did the idea take shape to erect a church exclusively for the German immigrants. Their numbers were quickly increasing as they came by the hundreds to work the fields or stoke the mills in the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. Bishop Whelan lobbied the Redemptorist Fathers for another resident priest, only to have his request twice rejected. However, Bishop Whelan's patience and persistence began to pay off. In 1854, two Redemptorist priests, Father Mueller and Father Holzer, came to Wheeling and re-established a mission in the Cathedral for the German Faithful. It was a formidable congregation that actually formed the majority of the local Catholic community. Although the river, railroad, and thirst for more land made for a very transient population, the Germans who intended to settle in Wheeling made a concerted effort to establish a more permanent church. With two German priests in residence, Bishop Whelan finally gave his blessing for Father Mueller to take up a house-to-house -house collection to raise money for a building site for a new German parish church. The quest to raise money proved hugely successful, taking only two weeks. On November 16, 1854, the property on lot number 111 was purchased. By the prompt acquisition of the property, the Germans of Wheeling showed their determination to build a church of their own. The cornerstone was laid in the summer of 1856, and toward the end of the year the shell of the building was finished. At a total cost of $27,526, the church was a simple brick building in Romanesque style, measuring 112 feet in length and 50 feet wide. The bell tower was added in 1871. The basement of the new church provided a large room, which was designated to serve as a school. To the right and left, and behind the sanctuary, a four-story building was annexed. This building was to serve as the rectory. The German Redemptorist priests had given so much in the service to the early church of the Diocese of Wheeling. In gratitude and in recognition of their ministry, Bishop Whelan agreed to name the church in honor of their Redemptorist founder, St. Alphonsus Maria Liguori. Although the beginning of his tenure was somewhat staggered, Father Stephen Huber was appointed the first pastor of St. Alphonsus Church. His full-time tenure began sometime between June and October of 1858. Father Huber was an exemplary pastor, well-liked and respected by all. He was distinguished by his charity and personal piety. Father Huber was pastor until January 10, 1859. After his term at St. Alphonsus, he was given charge of the Germans of St. Joseph Settlement in Marshall County. Father Huber was called to his eternal reward on September 27, 1891, at the age of 74. 
Perhaps one of the most fascinating, if not one of the most prolific pastors of the early history of St. Alphonsus is Father John Peter Carouche. The pastorship of Father Carouche was marked by brilliance and torment, sanctity, and at times, irreverence. Father John Peter Carouche enjoyed an unusually long career as pastor of St. Alphonsus for 24 years in succession. This was a rather remarkable achievement at the time due to the scarcity of priests and frequent transfers to needy missions. Father Carouche was born in Longwich, Germany on December 2, 1818. He arrived in the United States in 1843 and was ordained in Cleveland by Bishop Rapp in 1848. After various missionary assignments, Father Cruz was received into the Diocese of Wheeling and assigned the pastorship of St. Alphonsus Church directly after Father Huber in 1859. According to a later account of parishioners who were living in 1909, at the time of the Golden Jubilee of the parish, they reported that Father Cruz showed great zeal in ministering to his congregation and obtained good results during his first years. There was a general consensus by the congregation that Father Carouche was a dedicated and loyal servant to his flock. Father Carouche was particularly known for his desire to have the church adorned in a most elaborate manner during particular observances and celebrations. He took great pains in having the church decorated on feast days. These extraordinary church services would give the zealous pastor an occasion for displaying great festivity. He placed a crib in his church on Christmas and in Holy Week had the Holy Sepulcher decked in wonderful splendor. While these adornments may have been considered frivolous by some, it was Father Carouche who was the first priest to introduce and maintain this practice of extra liturgical display, a practice that is still observed 150 years later. Given the ever-increasing German Catholic population in the Ohio Valley, the pastoral work to be done at San Alphonsus could easily have kept two priests very busy. Bishop Whalen recognized this need and appointed the Reverend Leonard Kircher as the first assistant pastor. Father Kircher's tenure lasted only three years, as he was replaced in 1869 by Father Joseph Winter. Father Winter's service at St. Alphonsus was even shorter, lasting only three months, for which he was paid the hefty sum of $90. It was the beginning of 1870, and Father Carouche found himself without an assistant cleric or badly needed administrative help. It was at this same time that Father Carouche fell seriously ill and was confined to his bed. It may have been that Father Carouche's sickness was caused to a certain extent by the adverse turn of his private business affairs. He had grown up among those who had cultivated vineyards in Germany, and it was quite natural that he conceived the idea of following a similar path. His main reason for this undertaking was to supply his fellow priests with the purest of altar wines. Bishop Whalen encouraged him in this endeavor, for he himself was studying how the priests could obtain genuine altar wine. Accordingly, Father Cruz devoted his savings and nearly all his free time to the cultivation of an extensive vineyard that he had planted on a country hillside just above the city of Wheeling. The area, now known as Grandview Manor, was once the home to Father Cruz's labor of love. Many citizens of Wheeling may recall that Grandview Manor's original name was perhaps more appropriately titled. Up until the 1980s, this section of town was proudly called Vineyard Hills. To his credit, Father Cruz succeeded very well in supplying pure altar wine to his brethren. However, a fierce hailstorm in the spring of 1869 ruined the vintage. With time, this misfortune could have been overcome, but it was not to be. Father Cruz made a classic business mistake. He overextended himself by creating the vineyard on too large a scale. It was unmanageable given the modest resources he had available to him. At the time, many indicted Father Cruz for partaking in his private business venture, saying it took too much time away from his pastoral duties. He was staunchly defended in these accusations by Bishop Whalen, who even assigned additional ministers to the parish so that Father Cruz could tend to his vineyard. On the other hand, the labor of Father Cruz in his vineyard was an advocation to his pastoral work because he procured pure and genuine altar wine, which in those days was difficult to obtain. The vineyard project may have been both a blessing and a curse for Father Carouche. He cherished his time working the vines and the time it allowed for self-contemplation. However, it also caused great stress and anxiety. He had borrowed sizable amounts of money from several private individuals. Not having the means to meet his obligations, Father Carouche anguished over the situation and his misfortune. It may have been this event that served as the onset of his mental illness, a cross he would bear for the remainder of his life. 
Toward the end of 1870, Father Cruz began to recover from his ill health and failed business venture. It was definitely a time of resurgence in his life as pastor of St. Alphonsus. It was during this period that the good father initiated his two most notable legacies. In 1871, Father Carouche commissioned the renovation of the church. The building was repaired from the basement to its roof. The furnishings were either cleaned or replaced. Perhaps the greatest improvement was the acquisition of three wonderfully sounding bells. The work essentially continued to 1873. Notable improvements included a new baptismal font, a new tabernacle, statues of St. Elizabeth and St. Barbara, and an oil painting of the apostles Peter and Paul were also procured for the church. By many accounts, the greatest pastoral work that Father Cruz performed was the erection of the spacious school building in 1874. It was built at an opportune time when the necessity for educating the children of the parish was ever increasing. The doors of St. Alphonsus School first opened on April 1st, 1859. A total of 51 boys and 35 girls were in attendance. In the same year, St. Alphonsus Parish had a membership of 1,702 souls, according to a census by Father Carouche. In its time, the wonderful school building was considered the admiration of all Catholics in the area. In the first year, St. Alphonsus was a single-class school taught by one teacher who could teach no more than 80 pupils in an orderly manner. St. Alphonsus School, like all private and most parochial schools of the time, was not free. The parents had to pay tuition and other related expenses. An entrance fee of $4.50 was assessed. This was a time-honored custom. The fee for two full semesters was only $3. It is an interesting fact that the curriculum promoted the simultaneous study of two languages. It was believed that studying both made an easier study of each individual language. Erasmus wrote over 400 years ago that to become a great Latin writer, one has to study Greek as well. This was a very practical and grounded theory. In 1915, the school examiners of the Diocese of Wheeling pronounced a Marianite boy who spoke Arabic at home the best English scholar at St. Alphonsus School. The school continued to serve the local Catholic and ethnic communities for many years. The institution marked several milestones which added to the quality of academic life that reflected the prevailing culture of the time. In 1891, the Sisters of Divine Providence took charge of the school at the request of Father Maurice. An academy for girls was established in 1894. The Paris school even offered classes on the high school level between the years 1927 and 1940. The school progressed to contemporary times. However, due to the declining population and the exodus to the suburban areas, enrollment had a steady decline. The decision was made to close the institution, and 1988 marked the last class for St. Alphonsus School. Well, as we know, it was called the Dutch prison, and uh, certainly it wasn't a prison, but it was very regimented. Uh, school always started on time, there was, there was a bell, uh, there were recesses, you went out in the schoolyard, there, there was a bell, uh, you would say the Pledge of Allegiance. Each school day began at that time uh, with Mass. You automatically went to Mass, there was a morning Mass at 8 o'clock. School started in the vicinity of 8.30. Uh, we had the Sisters of Divine Providence, uh, a very good group. Uh, six or seven at least had nuns teaching those classes uh, at, at that time for me. Obviously we don't have that, the number of religious today. We don't see that, but I think they had a, a very favorable impression on most of the students. Uh, you know, prayer was part of that day. Uh, example, leadership. Uh, it, it was just a great place to grow up, and, and I can say that we were very adequately prepared for high school coming out of St. Alphonsus because uh, uh, they just took care of business. The erection of the school building in 1874 under the guidance of Father Carouche is considered even more significant since it was undertaken after the division of the parish. In 1873, Bishop Whelan cut off the southern areas served by St. Alphonsus and formed Immaculate Conception Parish. One of the primary reasons Bishop Whelan separated the neighboring communities south of St. Alphonsus was the need for the growing ethnic populations to have their own places of worship. The Irish Catholics were increasing significantly due to the migration from their famine-ridden homeland. It was also helpful for those who spoke only the English language to have a church where a foreign dialect was not the norm. 
St. Mary's Immaculate Conception Church was another welcome parish for the Diocese of Wheeling. Even in the midst of the separation of the church communities, St. Alphonsus and the new school building proudly continued to serve the faithful German Catholic population. While St. Alphonsus Parish celebrated its growth, it was during the same time that the Diocese of Wheeling experienced one of its most prolific losses. After 24 years as Bishop of the Diocese of Wheeling, the Most Reverend Richard V. Whalen was called to his final reward. On July 7, 1874, he spoke his final words, My work is done. Bishop Whalen was interned in the chapel on the grounds of Mount Calvary Cemetery. In the intervening years, St. Alphonsus Church saw a long and monotonous string of assistant pastors. Perhaps the only light to shine in this dark period was the welcome of the first Capuchin priest as assistant to Father Carouche. Father Francis Xavier Strunk came from Cumberland, Maryland on September 1, 1876. Unbeknownst to the parish, this was to be the beginning of a long and fruitful relationship with the Order of the Capuchins. Psychiatry was in its infancy, and people and friends that surrounded Father Carouche did not understand the ailment and torment with which he was afflicted. Father Carouche became increasingly irritable and impatient with his staff. Long quarrels would ensue, oftentimes with no provocation or reason. Today, we can see that Father Carouche suffered from schizophrenia. His illness was marked with hallucinations, a persecution complex, paranoia, and generally being victimized by his own imagination. Father Carouche's behavior unsettled his congregation. Fortunately, the majority of the parish took their Christian ethic to heart and stood by their affirmed pastor. Offering to support his retirement, a group of concerned parishioners offered Father Carouche a $600 per year retirement fund. It was with the urging of the new bishop, the Most Reverend John Kane, that Father Carouche settled to his beloved vineyard. There, he had a nice home with a private chapel. Father John Peter Carouche passed away on May 9, 1888. In a letter to Bishop Kane, one parishioner wrote, Be not unmindful of the many years he has devoted to our wants. He has stood by us in all our trials, consoled us in sorrow, advised us in trouble, and administered to us in sickness. Hear our childlike prayer and kindly accept our signature as a token of our esteem for him. The turmoil and administrative unrest during the latter tenure of Father Carouche left a wake of uncertainty and dissent. During this time, parishioners joined other congregations or stopped going to any church. The reception of the sacraments and catechetical instruction suffered even in those who remained faithful to St. Alphonsus Church. There was even legal action taken by Father Casanova against Father Carouche. The constant dissensions in the parish, without any prospect of a change for the better, prompted the leaders of the congregation to ask Bishop Kane to transfer the care of the parish to an outside religious community. It was hoped that in some way, peace and order would be restored to the Germans of St. Alphonsus and their parish could thrive once again. After much deliberation, Bishop Kane allowed two Capuchin fathers to take charge of St. Alphonsus on New Year's Day in 1884. When Bishop Kane entrusted St. Alphonsus Parish to the care of the Capuchins, he expected them to carry out the work at hand. He was not to be disappointed. The Capuchins had a rich history of successful evangelization and administration in times and places where others did not succeed. Their legacy emanates from Germany and stretches across Europe and even Ireland. They are also cited as ministering to the sparse Catholic population in early colonial settlements, decades before the American Revolution. It can be said that handing the spiritual care of St. Alphonsus to the Capuchin Fathers was a wise and poignant decision by Bishop Cain. In fact, the relationship between the Capuchin Order and the Diocese of Wheeling Charleston was to span 110 years. It was on June 12, 1994 that the wonderful and selfless spiritual caretaking of St. Alphonsus by the Capuchin Order came to an end with the celebration of a festive Mass of Thanksgiving. Nonetheless, it was the introduction of the Capuchin Order to the parish that indirectly led to the construction of the wonderful church building presently enjoyed by the St. Alphonsus Parish community. It was on January 1, 1884 that the first Capuchin pastor, Father Felix M. Lex, preached his first sermon at St. Alphonsus. Upon his arrival a few days earlier, one parishioner remarked, This is the best Christmas gift that God could have sent us. Father Lex was described as a lovable man of 27 years in the priesthood, who by his unselfish zeal and his sympathy for sufferers won the hearts of all who met him. 
Catholic life had suffered in the parish, especially among the younger generation, during the many years of disturbance. Especially notable was the neglect of assisting at Mass and receiving the sacraments. But the hardy and determined Capuchin fathers were up to the task. They implemented several reforms, some with little success, others with outstanding results. They invited the young girls of the parish to join the sodality of the Blessed Virgin. The church saw a welcome increase in attendance, confession, and receiving communion. One measure that did not work was the prohibition on round dancing by Bishop Cain. Those who engaged in the practice and even the spectators were considered to be indecent in public. The transgressors were subject to confession. The name of those who would not comply would be openly read during Mass. Needless to say, this regulation caused countless difficulties. After all, round dancing was part of their German heritage and never forbidden by church authorities in the old country. They couldn't understand why it was banned in their adoptive country. The case was eventually taken to Rome. Two years later, the reservation was lifted. The German congregation celebrated with nothing less than a festive round dance. Aside from the many advances in parish life during the tenure of Father Lex, one natural disaster literally came to the doorstep of the church. A great flood in February 1884, caused by heavy rains and melting snow, engulfed most of the downtown area. The city was underwater from the Market Street Bridge to 12th Street and from Center Wheeling up to Chaplin Street. In August of 1885, Father Anthony Schurman came to St. Alphonsus. It was a rather fortuitous appointment for the congregation. His assignment as pastor at Wheeling at the time was attributed to his architectural skill. It was also in anticipation of a church building program that Brother Alexis Willeck, an expert carpenter, was transferred to Wheeling as well. This brought the Capuchin contingent at St. Alphonsus to six members. Father Alexis began to notice several structural failures within the present church building. The increasingly large congregation added to the stress and wear beyond what the aging edifice could bear. Father Schuerman and Father Alexis lobbied Bishop Kane for the funds and permission to construct a new church. However, the bishop turned down his request not once, but several times. But Father Schuerman had a backup plan. To ease the bishop's mind, Father Schuerman assured Bishop Kane that the Capuchin order would assume the responsibility for any debt should the congregation fail to provide adequately for the expense of a new church. The pastor immediately appointed a building committee of eight men who were instructed to collect the initial funds so that the work of construction could begin. The last mass was celebrated in the old structure on Palm Sunday, April 11, 1886. The very next day, work commenced on dismantling the now vacant structure. During the interim, church services were held in the hall of the third floor of the school building. Rather than hire a general contractor to oversee the entire project, Father Schurman hired only subcontractors for each part of the building. The contracts for the foundation, laying the brick, plumbing, and carpentry were all awarded separately. As a result of the endless pastoral duties coupled with the mammoth task of building a new church, Father Schurman became seriously ill during the early phases of construction. He collapsed on July 21, 1886, but recovered sufficiently to make arrangements for the laying of the cornerstone. The joyous day came on August 1, 1886. The entire congregation and large numbers of Catholics from the vicinity and Pittsburgh attended the celebration. The foundation was elaborately decorated, as was the surrounding area. Today was to be the day that St. Alphonsus Parish community welcomed a new era and a new home. Father Schurman, the pastor and architect of the new building, delivered an inspirational address in German, after which the members of the parish clergy marched around the walls and blessed them with holy water. The cornerstone was then ceremoniously blessed and affixed to the foundation. The Latin inscription read, The Church of St. Alphonsus, Bishop and Doctor, founded 1856, rebuilt and enlarged 1886. Only two days later, Father Schurman departed the parish to seek a better climate to alleviate his health problems. Construction of the new church continued at a furious pace. By the spring of 1887, the outside walls had been built to a considerable height, and the basement was completed to allow for gatherings and other church functions. The new St. Alphonsus Church was a devotional and for practical purposes, a truly sacred place for worship. It was a credit to the congregation and to the architect. It has been characterized as a monument inviting the admiration of all classes and creeds. The dedication of the new church was held on October 22, 1887.
It was not only a church function, but also a great social event. Despite the charge of 50 cents, about 1,400 people attended the ceremonies, including many Protestants. The singing itself proved a great attraction. The interior of the new church was rich in iconic elements of worship. It was said that one must observe it in parts so as not to overwhelm the visual senses. The intricate detail of each statue was a sight to behold. The inviting sanctuary was close to heavenly. The experience of worship would transcend the ordinary and move one closer to God. The high altar is a masterpiece of Romanesque art. It was hand-carved in 1888 by three Capuchin brothers, Otto, Donatius, and Bernard, an undertaking which took them six months to complete. In the center of the frontal, a chalice is carved in relief, entwined with grapes and wheat, and the whole piece is surrounded by an inscribed scroll. Representations of Abraham's sacrifice are on the left, and of Melchizedek's sacrifice to the right. The tabernacle, topped by the throne, is placed on the table of the altar. The raised shelf or ledge above the table of the altar, in corresponding height with the throne, bears four paintings of adoring and musical angels and recessed in revolving niches. A life-size crucifixion group imported from Munich for $400 was placed in the center. It consists of four life-size figures. In the niche to the right of this group is a statue of St. Alphonsus, donated by the St. Alphonsus Society, and to the left, a statue of St. Francis of Assisi. The superstructure is 35 feet tall and 16 feet wide. The altar is made of oak wood. It was richly carved and heavily gilded. The work of painting and gilding was done by Brother Bernard, while the carpentry and carving were the work of brothers Otto and Donatius. The masterpiece of the three brothers was finished a few days before Christmas in 1888. The side altars, the work of Brother Otto, Brother Donatius, and Brother Ivo Eicht, were installed in March of 1890. The side altars are masterpieces of art and harmonized with the style of the high altar. They are also made of oak and beautifully finished. The one altar is dedicated to the Blessed Mother, and the other is dedicated to St. Joseph. An imposing statue of the Blessed Mother was placed in the center. To the right and to the left of the tabernacle crucifix, there are revolving niches bearing two oil paintings representing the stigmatization of St. Francis and the granting of the indulgence. Both paintings were executed in Munich, Germany. On the reverse side of the revolving niches, there are relics enclosed in glass cases. The statues of St. Louis and St. Elizabeth are placed on pedestals near the altar.
located at the rear of the church are two unique and rare altars. On the north side is the altar representing purgatory. This altar is adorned by a statue of Our Lady of Shestakoa. The other altar located at the rear of the church is the Trinity Altar. The folklore surrounding the statue overlooking the structure have it as being the only one of its kind in the world to having only one like it in the Vatican. No one knows for certain, but it is nonetheless a rare and unique work. Images of the Trinity are usually rendered in paintings and almost never cast in statue form. The great and sacred day for the consecration of St. Alphonsus Church was held on November 26, 1905. It was under the reign of Bishop Patrick J. Donahue, who replaced Bishop Kane in 1894. On this festive day, the church received a special dignity. The consecration made the new church sacred in its entire material structure and received the effects of the solemn prayer so that all those who will ever pray there in any trial whatsoever will be consoled. The Willing Intelligencer newspaper chronicled the account of this most notable day in the life of the parish. It read, Beautifully impressive were the consecration services conducted by Bishop Donahue at St. Alphonsus Church. The new edifice, which was erected nine years ago, was filled the entire morning with devout Catholics who were joining in the services which consecrated the church for the purposes of worship forever. The first undertaking at St. Alphonsus by Pastor Greck was the establishment of an orphanage for members of the parish. The institution was ready for operation in August of 1891. The main reason for building an orphanage was the need of a convent for the teaching sisters who were to be introduced into St. Alphonsus School. Since the Sisters of Divine Providence had no house in Wheeling, it was decided to connect the orphanage with the sisters' convent. St. Alphonsus Orphanage reached its peak in October of 1921. It was during the same period that electric lights were installed, as well as a new bathroom and parlor for the sisters. In the summer of 1955, the decision was reached to close the orphanage because of the few children in residence. Besides, only one child was actually from the parish. From 1886 until 1955, St. Alphonsus expended more than $143,000 for the care of the orphans and neglected children. All of this speaks well for the members of the parish and friends of the orphanage. Civic and fraternal clubs in the city of Wheeling were also generous to the orphans, often sponsoring picnics and parties. The Sisters of Divine Providence are due a great debt of gratitude for the care and devotion they have demonstrated during all the years the orphanage was in existence. The year 1903 may have seemed quite routine and without any particular happenings at St. Alphonsus. Of course, the church saw the wonderful liturgical celebrations of each season. However, the year 1903 marked a significant event for the diocese as St. Alphonsus Church was to welcome a new neighbor. Between the years 1890 and 1900, there was a steady stream of Polish immigrants to the South Wheeling area. It was these immigrants who felt the dire need of a priest who could understand and speak their language since they knew little or no German. A committee was formed to appeal to the Most Reverend Patrick J. Donahue, then Bishop of Wheeling, to come to their aid. Bishop Donahue graciously promised to do all in his power to assist in the plight of these Polish immigrants. In 1901, a young student from Saints Cyril and Methodius Polish Seminary in Detroit was ordained for the Diocese of Wheeling. It was Father Emil Musial. Given the task of organizing a Polish parish and building a Catholic church in South Wheeling, Father Musial showed the intensity of his faith and his national pride. His zeal and determination were great, and in the spring of 1902, ground was broken for a new church. In June of the same year, the cornerstone was laid. 
Not quite a year later, on February 22nd, 1903, on a beautiful, sunny, though snow-covered and frosty day, His Excellency, the Most Reverend Patrick J. Donahue, dedicated St. Ladislaus Church, at the time, the first and only Polish church in the Diocese of Wheeling. Our Holy Name men, they fill that whole center once a month. And they had their meetings on a Thursday. They prayed and had their office and everything. And then they stayed and had their beer and played cards. Across all time, mutual need and mutual help have united people in groups or societies for a common good. Societies forming within the Catholic Church is no exception. Since societies are able to procure advantages which the individual cannot obtain, they become agencies for improvement of private and social conditions. Throughout the rich history of St. Alphonsus, many societies have formed and answered the call to aid in the betterment of the parish community. The societies established in St. Alphonsus are divided into five classes, purely spiritual, Catholic action, beneficial, charitable educational, and youth. Catholic action, which is akin to the societies, was defined by Pope Pius XI as participation of the Catholic laity in the apostolate of the hierarchy for the salvation of souls. In its rich history, St. Alphonsus has welcomed many societies. Some have completed their goals, while still others continue their mission of service. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for the redemption and salvation of all people. His unselfish gift of his own life is perhaps the very definition of love. This lesson was not lost on the many brave men and women of St. Alphonsus and its sister parishes, St. Mary's and St. Ladislaus. Hundreds of men and women answered the call of military duty throughout the history of these parishes. They selflessly served in the armed forces of our country. I can remember we had on the Blessed Virgin's altar down at St. Lad's, we had the banner with all the stars for all the fellows that had been uh, in the service. We have our grotto, which was built in memoriam to all the fellows that served in the uh, war and also to those who were killed in the war. And to this day, we still have Mass uh, Memorial Day down at the grotto. Whether it be in the pursuit of one nation or in the interest of freedom for an entire continent, many of the sons and daughters gave the ultimate gift of their very lives to our country. Our diocese has been blessed by the unselfish sacrifice of its parishioners. More than names on a plaque, these individuals will always be honored in prayer and their souls will forever be with God. One of the most dramatic and sweeping changes ever to take place within St. Alphonsus and the worldwide Catholic Church occurred after the Second Vatican Council in 1962. Convened by Pope John XXIII, Vatican II dramatically changed the way in which the Catholic Mass was conducted. In many ways, Vatican II made the liturgy more contemporary by bringing the worship service to a more personalized level for the congregation. I attended St. Alphonsus when the Masses were still almost entirely in Latin. It was pre-Vatican II, uh, and I guess that was something special. As I say, when you think back, and, and I think of the very basics of the uh, Catholic religion, for me, they're based at St. Alphonsus. It was, uh, it, was, it was a very pious setting. I mean, the church with its statues, uh, uh, the color, the formality that the, that the priest brought to the table, the, the presence of the nuns, uh, it was kind of an old school Catholicism. Most notably was the change in language. Setting Latin aside, the Mass was now to be celebrated in English. I'm sure that there were a lot of people that Latin was strange to them. Maybe they didn't uh, understand all of it. But now everything being in English, there's no excuse for not knowing what's going on. The priest no longer faced the high altar and instead faced the worshipers. The table of our Lord was brought to the forefront and placed in the front center of the sanctuary. While many older prisoners to certainly made the Mass more welcoming and enhanced the spiritual bond between priest and flock. 
The changes were, were uh, quite easy for me personally. The, uh, the, the biggest change that people think about, of course, are the changes in the liturgy because that's what they see when they go to church. But the, the, the theology behind all of that was a wonderful theology. It, 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 it told us again what is basic in the Catholic faith. And the whole question of the people or the church. The year was 1995. It was under the administration of Bishop Bernard W. Schmidt that a very painful but necessary decision had to be made regarding the future of several parishes in the diocese. The decline in the state's population was evident in many of the cities and towns. In general, there was a marked decrease of families and individuals on parish rosters, since many chose to relocate to other parish communities outside of Center Wheeling. It became increasingly expensive to maintain all of the church buildings and support administrative salaries in light of the shrinking census. At the same time, the diocese also experienced a shortage of priests. This made it difficult to accommodate the spiritual needs of multiple parishes. Bishop Schmidt made the decision to close several parishes in the Wheeling area. Included on the list were St. Ladislaus and St. Mary's Immaculate Conception. So there was never a really a need. Once everybody spoke English well enough and all the services at St. Ladislaus and St. Alphonsus, as well as St. Mary's of course, was in English. So that there wasn't that need to have three churches. And so it seemed normal and natural for that territory being as closed in as it was, one church would certainly be enough. But it was an extremely difficult thing, of course, for anyone to give up the parish that they were born in, that they were baptized and, and married, that their parents were buried from there and so forth. Their commitment made it awfully difficult. The second great problem and pressing problem that made this thing happen when it did was the terrible shortage of priests. We simply didn't have enough priests. At one time, there were two priests at St. Ladislaus in South Wheeling, pastor and associate. There were two priests at St. Mary's, and there were two or more priests at uh, St. Alphonsus. But now they were down, and we could hardly keep one priest. So, and the numbers were not as great as they once were. The Polish people who uh, apparently maybe economically were doing better, they moved out of that section. So the, the numbers dwindled, both at St. Ladislaus, St. Mary's, and uh, St. Alphonsus. So it seemed natural to, to combine these parishes into one that would be really viable, and they could continue, they would have enough people and enough resources to continue Catholic education, to continue to pay all their bills, to take care of things properly. However, there was no intention of abandoning the faithful. The key to the sustainability of these parish communities was in consolidation. We integrated fine. I mean, uh, we're in, involved in the fundraising, involved in the music of the church, and uh, it's been a good mingling. On June 20th, 1995, St. Ladislaus and St. Mary's officially became part of St. Alphonsus Parish, and a new chapter in the church's history had begun. A wonderful milestone for the Diocese of Wheeling Charleston and the St. Alphonsus Parish community occurred on June 11, 2006. Bishop Michael J. Bransfield, along with Pastor John Gallagher, led the congregation in a joyous liturgy and celebration commemorating the 150th anniversary of St. Alphonsus Church. Angelic music and radiant sunshine beaming through the stained glass windows filled the church. Members sang and prayed for another successful 150 years and an eternity in the peace and love of Jesus. This particular summer day may fade into memory, but the occasion marking this momentous and joyous passage of time will forever be embraced within the rich history of the church. From humble beginnings to the wonder and splendor of present day, St. Alphonsus Church has spanned three centuries of worship and ministry in the name of our Lord. More than a strong and awesome building, it is a house of worship sanctified by our Catholic religion 
and the never-ending service of both clergy and laity. St. Alphonsus is a church community dedicated to the same ideals demonstrated in the life of its patron saint. To be unselfish in the service to others and to pray to have the zeal and strength to never cease. Across the never-ending spectrum of time, this monumental event commemorating 150 years will be celebrated. It will also mark another milestone that will be chronicled in the rich history of the parish. The year 2006 will be remembered as another chapter in the sketch through time in the life of St. Alphonsus Church. St. Alphonsus was born in the village of Marianella, near Naples, Italy, on September 27, 1696. His mother was a tremendous influence and instilled in him a deep sense of piety and respect for his Catholic religion. The education he received under the apprenticeship of his father, aided by his own intellect, produced in him such results that at the early age of 16, he graduated in law. It was an interesting twist of fate that took this young, energetic lawyer toward a life of spirituality and solemnity. In 1723, he lost a case, and God made adequate use of his disappointment. In spite of all opposition and a promising career in law, St. Alphonsus entered the ecclesiastical state and subsequently was ordained a priest in 1726. In 1732, he founded the Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer, with the objective of laboring for the salvation of the most abandoned souls. The congregation was the crowning glory that marked the life of St. Alphonsus. For all of his hard work, St. Alphonsus was appointed Bishop of St. Agatha, a diocese he governed until 1775. It was around this time that his health and vibrance began to fade. Few saints have labored as much, either by words or by deed, as did St. Alphonsus. He was a prolific and popular author, the utility of whose works will never cease. His last years were characterized by intense suffering, which he bore with resignation and dignity. St. Alphonsus was called to God's kingdom on August 1st, 1787. St. Alphonsus was canonized in 1839 by Pope Gregory XVI. He is only one of two saints in modern time to be given the venerable designation of Doctor of the Church. Uh, I've been here about a year and a half now as pastor, and we've had several great celebrations since I've been here. The first being the 10th anniversary of the combined parishes of St. Ladislaus, St. Mary's, and St. Alphonsus when the reorganization took place here in Wheeling. And this past uh, July, we had a celebration of our 150th anniversary as a parish here in downtown Center Wheeling. Well, it was 10 or 11 years ago I was named administrator. Uh, this was at the time they were going through the merging of parishes. So I was administrator here for about six months. It's a, a diverse community, uh, tight-knit, yes, the family is very important to this community. It is an older parish. Uh, but the families that have come over from the old countries, uh, from Poland and from Germany and from Ireland that have mixed here in this congregation are just uh, amazing, hardworking, very blue collar. Uh, family means a lot to them. Uh, so it's a, I won't say it's a tight knit parish, but it's a very diverse parish, but a unified parish. Well, as an Irishman, they probably, uh, the folks from St. Mary's were probably very happy 
the Poles and the Germans, uh, I, I've been accepted. I mean, people are very accepting. They know that uh, the bishop moves pastors around on occasion. And uh, it's, it's been a good transition from the chancery work back to the parish. Uh, working with people, working with families, the new, newly married couples, preparing them for their life together, and certainly baptisms. Uh, funerals are very important. It's an important time to gather the family together as they grieve. Uh, so it's, it's that interaction with the people that uh, I really appreciate the most. Well, just this past weekend, we had a little girl that just served her first uh, time as an altar server. And she told a story beforehand that her grandfather was an altar server 90 years ago and had given a pen that has been passed down through their family. I'm sorry, it was their great-great-grandfather that uh, had passed this pen down from family to family. And uh, uh, she had that pen and wore it that day. And that was just a touching moment. And of course, anytime we have RCIA, the Rite of Christian Initiation of Adults, and we bring people that we've worked with for months, um, teaching them about the faith, teaching them about the love of Jesus, and bring them into the church at Easter. Easter is always a very special moment, especially for myself being a convert to the church as well. Uh, Easter is just a grand celebration. Well, we have opened a new house of discernment. Uh, I am also the vocations director for the diocese and Bishop Bransfield has allowed me to start uh, what's called the house of discernment. It's not quite what we had before in the diocese, which was a house of studies. Men were here, they were taking classes at Wheeling Jesuit and uh, going back to the house of studies, which was on National Road. But we have two men living here now and that was the former site of the Spirit House. Uh, here on the campus. Uh, we had a youth center that's below the church that has worked with at-risk children and we're still seeking funding and looking at how we're going to be able to reorganize that as well. Well, everybody that walks into this church says, oh, this is the most beautiful church. And I say, well, you have good taste and I agree with you. Uh, it is, I think with the statues, it is a very traditional church. Uh, we have probably one of the largest altars in the diocese. And uh, what I see happening here, I certainly hope to see growth occur uh, with all the new development that's going on in Wheeling now. Hopefully new families will be moving into the area. I do hope to see younger, a younger population here. Uh, the unfortunate thing is the school closed back in the 80s and a lot of folks that have children when they reach school age move to another parish in order to obtain the, the less tuition. And I can't blame, blame them for that, but what happens is they tend to find friends and family in that parish then and don't come back. So uh, we hope to kind of turn the cycle on that a little bit. Right now, I don't see that as a possibility. I mean, with the grade school, uh, we support the grade school as well as the cathedral, um, Central Catholic grade school. And I just don't see the, the population for uh, opening the new school. Well, that's a good question. Hopefully, people will have appreciated what you've done and see the work you've done and have been drawn closer to, to Christ through the work you've done, uh, through the masses you've celebrated, through those that you've buried, they remember you. Uh, the pictures that we take at baptisms, uh, you know, when those children are grown and uh, I've not been here long enough or been in a parish long enough to have experienced that where you baptize a child and then you actually marry that child later. Uh, but I, I look forward to those days and uh, when they look back, hopefully they have fond memories and happy memories of their time here at St. Alphonsus. Well, sitting here as a congregation, looking up at the high altar, that is the most impressive. That is what strikes you when you walk into the building. 
And just to know that three Capuchin brothers took six months to hand carve that altar is just an amazing feat of uh, human ingenuity. And then to know that later, just six months later, they built the two side altars, Mary and Joseph. Uh, and it is just a truly a work of art. And to sit here and look at those, it's just a marvel. Uh, it's like looking at a, you know, Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel or just the work that went into that, the intricacy of the, the hand carving and, uh, is just amazing. And the Capuchins, uh, what they've done for a hundred years in this parish and how they built this parish and what they've done for the people here is just amazing to read that history. Well, just make sure that you maintain this place and keep it up. Uh, we just put a new roof on, and I, I told the fellow that had done the work that I said, you know, I'll be dead when this place needs a new roof. So all I would say to the people 150 years from now is what you've got is built upon hundreds of years of work and people's sweat and blood to offer this to you. And I would just say, please take care of it.